Hello and welcome to The Seventh Rule with your stars, Sirach Lofton, who was Jake Sisko on Deep Space Nine, and Aaron Eisenberg, who was Nog the Ferengi on Deep Space Nine. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and we are going to talk to you about Deep Space Nine. We're going to cover uh, the Deep Space Nine world premiere documentary and who the guests are going to be there in Hollywood. We're going to talk to you about a little bit of Picard news, if there is any. We're going to cover uh, the pilot episode called Emissary of Deep Space Nine because we're starting this whole Deep Space Nine rewatch. And, uh, but first, we've got... The, oh, wait, maybe I shouldn't show the... We've got, <laughs> we've got a package Oops. from our good friends. Um, so I'll open that up in just a second, but while I'm opening that up, uh, let's talk about the Man's Chinese Theater in Hollywood that's going to be showing the Deep Space Nine documentary, What We Left Behind, which is an amazing documentary. I mean, it's really, really well done. A little upsetting to me, but yeah, it was an excellent documentary. The guests uh, <laughs> there will be uh, the three of us, plus Nick yes! Nikki, Nikki DeBoer, Esri Dax. Esri Dax. Um, and we're going to be doing some Q&A. Uh, we've got, and Aaron just got a great news text uh, from Levi, right? Tell us about it. I did. I did. So since the show at the theater is doing so well, I, they, they might have sold out and now they're moving it into a bigger theater, their second biggest theater, which has 446 seats. So now I'm assuming by that uh, message, more tickets are now available. Uh, which is fantastic. Um, and it's going to be so much fun. Ciroc's going to be there. I'm going to be there. Ryan's going to be there. Nikki's going to be there. Uh, and we're going to have an intro for the showing. We're going to be there for the showing. And then as Ryan said a few minutes ago, we're going to do a Q&A with all the, all the attendees, everybody there. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're also going to tape it the best we can for our show here at the 7th Rule. So that'll be a lot of fun to give you guys, the patrons, uh, a sneak peek uh, at our Q&A. You guys will get it first. Um, and then a few weeks later, we'll put it up, uh, the whole Q&A up on our YouTube channel and on Odyssey as well, uh, the audio version. So tune in, keep your ears open. And if you get this and you're in the LA area on May 13th, please try to get some tickets through Fathom Events to come out to the Chinese theater to view DS9, the documentary. And I'll tell you, Sirach and I were both in Birmingham when we watched it. It was, it's, it's great. They really, really did a great job. Um, you didn't watch it in Hollywood with us? I, I did. Were... I did oh, see yeah. it at Paramount as well. Uh, yeah, that's right. We were there, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I think Ciroc avoided me that day. But that's okay. I had Melissa there to keep me. That day or, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and it was really good. Uh, it was really good. And, and. Again, I, I honestly love what Ciroc had to say in the documentary. I thought he said some very important totally. things. And, um, and, and I'm glad that they used them and kept them in there. And I thought Nana was hysterical. And so was Andy. Andy was great. So I hope all of you guys get to see it, whether in L.A. or somewhere else. It's a great documentary. They put a lot of work into it. And we'll, we will be there on May 13th at the Chinese Theater in Hollywood. At Hit 6 o'clock, we will be there. But the show begins at 7. Pause that for just a second. This is a shout out to Josh Haas. Josh Haas who sent us this. And this is the unveiling, the unboxing of it. <laughs> that is the biggest self-sealing stem bolt <laughs> I have ever seen. <laughs> well done, my friend. Well oh, done. Dude, that's a wow, self-sealing stem that. bolt. So we now have a self-sealing stem bolt that you guys have been looking for for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. We got one. We got one. Now we just need a time crystal. <laughs> so here's, a, here's this card. He included that in there. Hazlabs.com. Hazlabs.com. Might be backwards to you guys, but you see that there. No, I don't think thanks so. For, I think it worked out. Thanks very much, Josh. And he gave us a, a nice long dissertation to read on our own time. Thanks very much. That's really Thank cool. you, Josh. Let's uh, finish up talking about the uh, the documentary. We all saw it. It was an A plus documentary. It's unbelievable. So please get your tickets if you're in the LA area. Come join us in Hollywood on 
Monday, May 13th. That's one week from today. Sirach, you saw it. What do you think of it? I saw it. And I've actually, every time I see it again, I see something new that I actually didn't really pick up on the first time. Cool. Uh, and I think it's just a great documentary. It's almost like a, a, a an episode in itself uh, wrapped up in, in yeah. into, a, into a documentary. So it's amazing in that way. Um, I think they did a really good job. Uh, there's a lot of funny moments. I think Marco Limo has uh, some funny moments in there. <laughs> <He's awesome>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and there's, you know, there's just, uh, it just shows that, you know, all these years later, we still uh, have such a strong feeling of attachment for the show. And all of us have uh, a bond of working together so long and in the trenches so long that, uh, you know, we, the camaraderie is there. And that's one of the beautiful things about um, Star Trek as a franchise and, and, you know, as a TV show is that it gives us the opportunity because of conventions to see each other. Mm -hmm. And absolutely. And, and to kind of re, you know, reignite those, those friendships and, and, and to keep it current and catch up with each other and in, in how our, how we're doing in our lives. So that's one of the, the real blessings of being a part of this franchise is that, you know, uh, we get to celebrate, uh, the, you know, the success of the show um, many years after the show has gone on, so gone off. So I'm really and I thinking. feel like it's gotten a, a resurgence of success. You know, I mean, the, the sales and the interest in the DVD have been phenomenal. They've been great. Everybody really wants to get out there and see it. And, and as the theater has to move into a bigger theater because tickets are selling for it. It's, it's, it's awesome. wonderful. And I think Netflix and the fact that, you know, the, 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 the way we watch shows over the years has changed to benefit our show uh, a lot. And I think, I think our show has found a lot more love now than it did back when it aired on TV. And people are realizing, wow, this was really a good show. Uh, it was well done. It was well told. It was a, a lot of important stories, as you mentioned in our our previous uh, uh, little show we just did, uh, the philosophical ideas and elements it put forth in the show, especially yeah. in the, in the, in the um, uh, pilot that we're going to talk about, that it, it set a tone right away for that. And, and a little offshoot on that, I was watching that and I was thinking how people at the time didn't say, would say DS9 is in Star Trek. And, and when I watched Emissary, this is probably the third time I've seen it, I find new things, as you say, about mm. the documentary. And in that whole thing, when he's in the wormhole, I, I, I actually, I think I paid attention more. And then I start saying, this is so Star Trek. And, and I totally. was like, wow, how did people miss that in that pilot? You mm. know, they always say the first two years. But we came out of the gate with those elements. Um, and especially with, you're going to destroy us. No, I'm not here to destroy you. I'm not your enemy. Little things like that, as well as when Cisco goes on that journey through all the characters of his life that become uh, the wormhole alien or slash the prophet, depending on how you look at it, speak to him through, right? right. I have to say, you did really a fantastic job in that, being so young and recognizing what you were really doing in that. Uh, in those scenes. I thought that was really good. But he was so philosophical in the things that he was saying. And it was, it was pretty, pretty great. And the questions yeah. they were asking him. So that's a great segue into what this show is going to be about is this, we're going to uh, cover this pilot episode. We're doing like a rewatch where we are going to watch every single episode week by week. And every week we're going to be covering an episode. So this first one, obviously, we're doing the pilot, but just to put a button, a final button on the what Sorry, we left Ryan. behind documentary. <laughs> Did I um, jump? That's okay. Uh, <laughs> personally, I can tell you that, you know, as just a fan and not a person that acted in the show, I can say that I watched it after two hours when it ended, I could have totally watched another two hours. Like I was completely mm. gripped, enamored, entertained. I could have continued to just sit there and soak it up and relive it and, and hear about it and listen to the interviews. And that's really the highest praise you can give a documentary. So I do hope that everybody goes out, gets their tickets, especially if you're in the LA area, come check us out. You know, and one other thing I want to add to that, Ryan, yeah. that I think is cool is that 
uh, the fans will have an opportunity by watching the documentary to really get inside of the writer's room. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody, anybody seen that. I actually, the first time I got to see how the writers communicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to see how they communicate with each other, how they strategize for story arc, how they come up with ideas, how they bounce them off each other, I think is really an insight to being there present in the room. Now, I know it's obviously edited for the purpose of the film, but I've never had an opportunity to really feel like I'm inside behind, you know, behind the scenes and yeah. watch how, how these ideas make it to the, the chalkboard. And, and, and the chalkboard isn't a metaphor. There literally is a chalkboard <laughs> yes. with all their yes. stuff. Yeah, and, and, so cool. And one of the, there was one, I won't say it here because let's wait till at least after May 13th to, to talk about specifics. But there was one character that really wasn't mentioned in very much in, in their season eight, their, their uh, uh, fantasy season eight. But if you watch the documentary closely, you see that character's, character's name, try not to make, sh make sure it's not male or female, on the board. Uh, and, and I remember asking one of the writers about that and they're like, yeah, we had a plan. We had a plan, not just for the first episode, but continuing. I'm like, ah, cause we didn't see this character. And, um, so it was really cool, but I don't want to say who it is, but no, stay I tuned. did notice it on the board. Stay tuned for that. And, uh, we're going to try to record our Q and a for the patrons that we have on our Patreon account. So also you guys stay tuned for that. And with that, let's move on to, uh, is, there, is there even any Picard stuff to talk about? They've been recording, filming for about anything, two weeks yeah. now up in Santa Clarita. We'll keep you updated on that. Let's move on to I know I, wasn't, I didn't get a phone call. Did you get a phone call, Sirach? Not yet, but I have to check my other phone. <laughs> <laughs> so Emissary, uh, personally, I think Deep Space Nine is still the best written series in all of Star Trek. And I think that Emissary is still the best pilot episode. Really? Yes, best what? written, best written. Why do you feel that? I mean, um. <laughs> Put you on the spot, Ryan. Yeah, I mean, I don't wanna say too, you know, it's, it's not that the, uh, it's not that it wasn't easy to be better than the other pilots, mm -hmm. but that's part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the Star Trek pilots have been, you know, subpar and it's taken them some time to really build up. This was the first one where it had very high, or it's the only one really where it had such high stakes. Uh, it had such potential that was opened up. It wasn't just, here's a new crew on a ship. Mm -hmm. It was, here are all of these different elements in this strange situation, in this strange point in time with different races and all that. I mean, it really was like a hotbed for, for storylines. As a writer, they were probably chomping at the bit thinking, look, we can do Starfleet stuff, we can do Bajoran, we can do Cardassian stuff, we can do kids-centered stuff, we can do you know comedies, we could do romance, we could do war. I mean, it, it, it's just like the sky's the limit. And in that opening scene, the opening sequence with, uh, you know, the ship going down, getting destroyed with Lieutenant Commander Sisko and uh, J.G. Hertzler as the, uh, the Vulcan the captain. The scariest Vulcan ever. And they also had a Bolian security officer. But that opening sequence was just phenomenal. That, yeah. that gets you hooked from the very beginning. So I don't know what Star Trek fans really, if they had a problem with that immediately because it didn't feel like Star Trek, I don't really know too much about that. But I well, know when I first saw it, I was like blown away. I was like, this is the best in Star Trek episode I've ever seen. You know, just to touch upon what you just said there, and then, and then I hear what Ciroc felt by the, the beginning as well. But um, you just expressed how much potential you saw on the show. I remember hearing from fans when I started going to conventions, the opposite. It's not going anywhere. So what they saw is stuck on a station and not trekking to uncharted areas, right? So, so it's interesting how you saw something different than others did. I'm almost positive Melissa, my wife, uh, would echo what you just said. 
though those that those kind of potentials and i thought they did a fantastic job of slowly bringing in, in all the pieces and characters and feel like exposition oh hi i am i'm the science officer oh hi i'm the bajoran first officer it, there wasn't any exposition everybody was brought in yeah with a flow and, yeah with a really good flow uh, and especially that little thief, you know, I mean, that was probably, the <laughs> yeah, he was amazing. <laughs> I, I think that what, what I, what I thought stood out for me was the tension. Um, right away, there was this, you know, tension. There was this um, terrible, tragic loss of life. So you start off on such big conflict and seriousness. So right away, it's like, oh, Cisco loses his wife. Oh, uh, he's face to face with Picard and really talking to Picard, I think, in a way that nobody had before. I loved that scene. And I think the, the way he challenged Picard really made him uh, stand out as captain worthy material because mm -hmm. we had never seen anybody, you know, kind of check Picard in that kind of a way mm -hmm. where he where he said, you know. Uh, in I'm, the mean times. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but in, with with class and under the okay. under the the rules of you know uh, chain of command, he still engaged him with his own level of authority because he was such uh, such deeply affected by the tragedy that we had seen. So yeah. I think Avery really did a great job as, as far as conveying that uh, message that you know. I'm my own man. I'm going to make decisions for myself. I don't care what protocol is. I'm, this is life or death for me now. And I have to make what, the decision that's right for me and my family. So mm -hmm. I don't care about what you think I should be doing. Yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to do what I think I should be doing. And I thought that was really kind of unprecedented for, for you know, the beginning of a show starting out with just that kind of a, you know, conflict. Yeah, and, and what was great about that is he starts in one place, right, that this is not conducive to raising a son, and that's yeah. his number one priority, raising you. So it demonstrated uh, not only a strong Starfleet officer, but somebody that actually put parenting before his job. That's right. That's, the, uh, that's another thing that, that brought on the potential was that this brought on the family element that hadn't been mm -hmm. present before. Right. Deep Space Nine, above almost anything, was about family. And it start, you know, it's, it begins and ends with, with Sorok and Avery, you know, that there was that family bond from the, the moment that the show started all the way, you know, throughout, that was the through line to the, to the very end. And, um, oh, oh you, I just want to say this in the relationship. One of the things, because you brought up Avery, I love how he has, he changes when he's with you, Jake, mm -hmm. than when he's with everybody else. There, there is a, 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 a very apparent change in his demeanor and his energy. And, his, and, and it's just wonderful to watch from one actor to another, how Avery with you, there's this, you're my son, I'm your father, and I love you with everything, to I'm commander, and now I'm in charge, and I have to get all this together. You yeah. really see that difference. It wasn't... Yeah, Avery really conveyed, yeah. once again, you know, credit to him, how he conveyed these different feelings and emotions in very subtle ways, you yeah. know. Uh, like you said, his interaction with me brought out a softer, yes. very fatherly side. And then when you see him go away from that, he's this leader, uh, thoughtful, uh, willing to you know take ca calculated risks and 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 do brave things. But then you see him on the other end, and he's so uh, vulnerable when he's with me. Yes, excellent word. And you know what's also he's not going there, and he's not coddling you either. You know no. when you're complaining about your bed, he's all Jake. You got to we got to step up. This is where we're at now. All right. He's still being a parent. A parent. Right? Oh, is that when, when Jake goes, okay, and he goes, 
okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Melissa, like, yeah. Melissa was watching it with dad. He's cool, dad. <laughs> Melissa was watching with me, and she loved your reaction when he smiled at you because yeah. she said it was honest. You didn't smile back, you, or you did slightly right at the end, but you didn't go, okay. You, you were still, ah. and she loved that small little moment of honesty. And did he, yeah. Sirach, yeah, that's a good point. Did he do things a little differently between takes that every once in a while would give you those like genuine reactions? Like, like always, was, always. And I, like. I mean, the, that second okay was added. That wasn't, mm, that right. wasn't in the script. He, he does that. Yeah, that little mimic that mocking me where he's playfully mocking me. Uh, that's him. He made that. He he brought that on the spot. Okay, wow. beautiful. So that that's to, him. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. He did that to me on Heart of Stone, when um, and I loved it. We were doing that scene, and I'm 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 fighting with him because he wants to know why why do I want to go to Starfleet so bad, and in rehearsal he never grabbed me, he never once touched me. And then when we were rolling and we come around and he goes, tell me Nog. And he grabs me and pulls me in. And I remember like this was yesterday. I remember going, oh yeah, this is awesome. You're know, just living in the scene. And, yeah. and I loved working with Avery because he literally was always in that moment. And, and you know, and I, I can't wait to hear your little tidbits and stories as we watch these shows like you just shared with that okay was added because you see the relationship between you two on screen that's so strong and i know watching it off screen watching you two and i'll be honest i was always a little bit like can i come can i i, 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 I want to be with you guys <laughs> and you know not <laughs> once did, away, not I, once uh, did Sirach ever go I want to be with the Ferengi family. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they were so tight, Ryan. Mm -hmm. They were so tight. And, and it's that love that you saw. You know, I think Avery, as you mentioned this, and you, you will tell more about it, he really took you under his wing. He really brought you in to him and his life and looked out for you. And I saw that off screen, and you definitely see it on screen, you know? Yeah, and he said he's also, you know, to his credit, you know, there's different kinds of actors. And there's some kinds that try to overpower you in a scene and try to dominate. Mm -hmm. And then there's some that give you, they give you like rope to, so you can do your thing. Yeah. And Avery was the type of person that always gave so you could, so you had the opportunity to shine in your own scene. He wasn't really concerned about, because he can easily take over a scene and, and oh yeah, and and really just dominate it to the point where you're like almost scared and shy. Yeah, if he wanted to, you yeah. know, it's like it's like Shaq, you know, Shaq could easily, you know, barrel his way into and dunk every single time and clear out space. But he's a gentle big man, you know. He he's not <laughs> trying to he's not trying to, he's not trying to give you forty five stitches over your eye, which he could. Yeah, um, you know, but. That's what I felt like with, with Avery. He was always giving in that way and always trying to make sure that I felt comfortable in the scene and, and, and that I was prepared to do, to do my work. And I had all the, the conditions that, I, are you, okay? you know, you, you get your yeah. lines, you're ready, do you, need, you know, you, need, you want to rehearse. He would run lines all the time. Mm. And, and, you know, for the star of the show to take out in, in between take time to run li lines with other people, that's not common. Armin did that too. It, Armin did that. And but, Max. But yeah. it's not a common thing. Yeah, um, you're right. I mean, you're right. I've, I've worked on other things and, you know, everybody goes back to their dressing room. Nobody's hanging around running lines for the next scene. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't run lines with you. I was like, no, I got it. I'm good. Well, I actually asked. That was a request of mine, but that's, that's <laughs> separate. You know, a uh, little known fact about Shaq, he loves his double doubles at In-N-Out Burger. That's good uh, to know. To go, it's good to know. Like four double doubles one time on a shoot, but uh, we're, we're, Aaron's like, "Why are you telling us?" <laughs> That's a crazy <laughs> segue there. That was, hey, my, you know that was my way. I of saying, want to bring up I want for the emissary episode. Well, hang on. I, we got to go to the break right now. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So we'll talk about that in just a second. <laughs> There's also something I noticed 
when we rewatched The Emissary that I hadn't noticed before. And it's just so good. I feel like it's going to be this juicy thing that's going to carry us through like three years of these shows. And I can't wait to ask you guys about it. And we'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Wow, that's a good tease right there. Thanks, man. <laughs> I, it's all bull. I just made it up. It's bullshit. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Tim Dazarn, uh, Aaron Eisenberg, Sirach Lofton from Deep Space Nine. That's Nog and Jake Sisko. Aaron Eisenberg was also a, a Kazon in... Uh, yes, Voyager. Voyager. What was the character's Aaron. name? You still don't remember? Oh, my character's name was Carr. But Carr. the actor I was saying we should bring on the show was Tim Dazarn, who played... I think it's pronounced Halix. Hold on. So long ago, Helix. I had to look it up. Halise. Halise. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, I actually saw him for the first time last year in Vegas. No and it was so great reconnecting with him. Really nice guy. So we should ask him to come on the show sometime. Stay tuned for that, you guys. If you want to see uh, the guy that played alongside Aaron as fellow Kazons in the Voyager episode on our show, please comment below. And even if you don't, please comment below and say that you do. It's, it's nice. It's nice. Uh, be nice. Yeah. Come on. Would it hurt you to be a nice person for once? Unbelievable. So, but Ciroc's like, this is between y'all, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of this. I'm going to stay out of this. So back to uh, Deep Space Nine, the Emissary yes. episode. We're doing a rewatch. And uh, the first episode is called Emissary. It's a two-part pilot, best pilot in the history of pilots practically. Um, and I did notice something upon rewatching it that I hadn't noticed or thought of before. Did you guys realize that in that entire first thing episode that sets up the entire show with this guy and his buddy, who's this guy's nephew, you guys didn't even meet in the first no. entire first episode. The two best friends, Tarak had his story arc with the, the family aspect of things with with the, the lead of the show uh aaron had his family aspect with uh quark and rom somewhat uh and also showing that there's a lot of conflict on the show that that it's not just all you know cherries and pumpkin pies like you know the first two iterations of star trek it's not just a, you know the village of happy people in space but it's different personalities different races different people from walks of life and some are going to be thieves. Some are going to be, <laughs> some are going to be grumpy and harumph in every scene like Odo. So I want to know what your first experiences were before you guys even met each other. Like in those first scenes that you did, you know, were you just kind of blown away by the whole thing? Were you just focused on, on your scene? Were you, was it fun already? What, what was it like? Hmm. Uh, my first scene was uh the the fishing scene really yeah that was the first time i got on the set the pushing scene the fishing fishing scene. oh fishing sure the fishing scene on the on the uh bridge there and that was at griffith park oh wow oh, did so you do i'm assuming because that's normally how we shoot right all the things that happened on the fishing even when you were um a slash wormhole alien prophet right yeah. And it wasn't one day shoot. I think it was a couple of three days worth of being there to do that. Uh, so that was my first time, actually. And then seeing the set, the first time being on the set. <clears throat> well, hang on. I just wanted to say. Be on the promenade. You also, did, you also did the part and the fishing scene where you, where you were one of the prophets. And, like, did they give yeah. you, like, right. a piece of information, say, just do it emotionless. You're just, you're an alien being, yeah. uh, you know, did they give you any? Little... Yeah, they gave me some instruction like that, basically. Yes, you, you, you're you an all-knowing alien being that's kind of engaged in trying to understand, uh, you know, what the captain or the commander is thinking at the time or is exper experiencing. So that was the note to me. I, and uh, actually going back and looking at it again, that was kind of interesting to watch because you could see, you know, it was cool to see that uh, how me and other characters were playing, you know, um, dual roles as far as being mm -hmm. ourselves and also being this alien version of ourselves or hosted by. So but it also flowed together so well. Once you saw them 
yeah. everybody playing those aliens it flowed together so well. It was, it was brilliant. That might have been the best part of the, the episode. Was. That, was, that was one of the best parts of the episode, yeah. the seamlessness with which they integrated the, uh, mm-hmm. everybody to be the aliens. So I thought that was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Aaron, what do you think? Uh, about what? Your scene? <laughs> All or of no, it. No, no. Just, the, the, or what my first uh, scene was. Yeah, your yeah. first scene. Oh, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, I wasn't actually, I know I goof around a lot. I really wasn't trying to be funny. I was actually thinking, I wanted to ask you, because you were, what, 14, right? Weren't mm-hmm. you 14 or 13? 13. 13. Was that difficult to kind of go from Jake and, um, you know, the son of, of Cisco, and then now you're actually a prophet slash wormhole alien speaking to uh, Cisco? Was that yeah. a difficult, like, whoa, I'm not sure how this is working out? Or did you go, oh, I totally got it, totally get it? I, I don't remember what my thought process was at the time. Um, I was just curious. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what my thought process was. I just know that, you know, I was given an explanation and I, you know, I usually take some advice or constructive criticism and try to incorporate it whenever I'm making adjustments. Sure. Performance wise. So, well, cause I thought you did a great job. That's why I thought you did a really good job of, of splitting the two. So, you know, yeah, I, I <clears throat> rewatching it, I was kind of, uh, you know, I enjoyed seeing the, the split in the two. So I, I, you know, not to toot my own horn, but it was, it was good to see that. Yeah. Good uh, to see that it worked, right? That yeah. it worked and that it was, it was yeah, it worked. And, uh, and also credit to the writing, which is what I was kind of, com- you know, comparing our show to uh, Discovery. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the writing got right into these very rich philosophical questions right away. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the questions that I thought that was interesting that was brought up in Emissary was when they brought Cisco to the, the moment in time when he lost his wife. Oh, I think I'm going to have to agree with you on this one. Yeah. Go. And they, and they told him, uh, you, you live here. You exist here. You exist here. That exactly. That was the best. I thought the same thing. Best moment. Yeah. Right. And it's like it kind Why? of it, it brings it brings like to all of us, at least to me personally in my own life, what experiences, whether they're good or bad, do I hold on to and exist right. in? What place of state of mind do I exist in? Whether it's good or bad, and we all have have those kind of uh, moments in our life that are life defining, mm-hmm. and. And we exist in those spaces, you know, for almost for the rest of our lives. You know, you see guys that come out of uh, Vietnam, for example, mm-hmm. and they still exist in that that mind state or that time frame yeah. where the, that they experienced. And even though they've moved on, the linear of it, their mind is still attached to that. Their feelings and emotions are still attached to that moment in time. And I thought that was an interesting question philosophically. And I thought that the writers did a great job of kind of, because Cisco goes through this whole thing, experience, you know, we live linear lives and we don't, and then they they use his own kind of argument against him and say, well, if that was true, then how come you're still holding on to this moment? So that was that defining moment for him. Yeah. That episode. Yeah, Yeah, actually that's, that's one of the things I was thinking when I was saying how it had so much potential was at that moment, I got it as if I was watching it for the first time in 1991 or 92, you know, as, as if I I was in 1992 and watching this for the first time, it hit me. This is what's different about this show. The other shows were about exploring new life, new civilizations, science, and all this kind of stuff. This was about exploring humanity. This was about exploring people and Mm -hmm. lessons and relationships. relationships, not about, alien of the week, not about anomaly of the week, but about relationships and how we, we live and we think in the human condition. And when, you're, when, when they bring in all these different aliens and different elements, it's for to help, it, the, the writers are using that to help us to understand the human condition better. Um, and so anyway, when you mentioned that, that scene, I, I thought that was that was the crux of the whole episode right there because that was his aha moment. And that's when he flipped and that's when he said, I'm going to move forward linearly rather than living in the past 
and saying, I, you know, I reject Picard. I reject the station. I reject all this stuff. And now he's, and then he starts talking about baseball and how we don't know what's going to happen. All we can do is just give it a shot, you know, and, and see what happens. And that's why he has that baseball throughout the series. Uh, what are you saying, Aaron? Um, I actually tweeted out that scene the other day when I was watching it. And, and one thing to note was that it was Jennifer Sisko that answers him, that, that asks him the question, which was important. And I think, you know, Ira gets a lot of credit for the show, but at this time, I think a lot Michael. of this credit, right, goes to Michael Pillar. Right. And, mm. and, and we the don't vision. mention The vision Michael there is so, so amazing. It's so yeah. layered contextually. Like, like you just said, it's Jennifer who's actually saying it to him. Why right. are you stuck here? Why do you exist Perfect. here? Which yeah, he like, says, Cisco says, I don't want to be here because they keep bringing him. And she says, then why do you exist here? Yeah. And, um, and it, it is such a great question. And it's, and it's really a, a wise question for all of us. Like you said earlier, why do we keep ourselves in certain parts of our life? Why do we continue to exist in certain areas that we don't want to let go of for some reason? And, and, and how he says later, it's not linear. We think of our life linear, but it, be, it becomes nonlinear because we hold on to everything that makes us who we are. Yeah, like he says earlier, it's it's really deeper show upon second or third watching. I think for most people, unlike Ryan, who's the most intelligent being in the world, who watches it the first time and realizes what how he, <laughs> I, I was making a joke because you seem to flatten it. From the I had so much what? pressure on my shoulders all of a sudden. <laughs> I was like, I got so much to live up to. Oh, oh my. You, you seem to pick up on it on first showing. But remember, a lot of people didn't like the show and said it's not Star Trek for the opposite reasons that you felt it was. Mm -hmm. Our show was all about relationships, and Ira knew that. So he took the baton and ran with it, right? Michael Piller started the race with Rick Berman, put this, this gem together, pushed it forward, but a lot of people resisted it because it wasn't trekking. It wasn't on a spaceship on a five-year mission with stories of the week, per se. They did, but within the context of the serialized show. So, and, 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 when, and when I, I'll finish with this, I'm sorry, sir. When, they, when I watched it yesterday, I'm like listening more closely and going, this is totally Star Trek. How are they missing this? And all the relationships being set up, how he handles Kira, or how, not handles, that's a poor word, how he begins. It, it, I would say handles, because it is a little bit of a handle. But he handles it. There's a little bit of a handle, because she comes off very aggressively in their first scene together, but, when she says, oh, I suppose you're here to take the office. <laughs> Wait, you know what he says? He, says, he goes, I'm going to say hi. He's, I'm here to, to say hello. Like, yeah, you know. I will take the office. No, but he goes, and we can I'm do it in either order. Hi, and then I'll take the office. Yeah. We could go either way. Exactly. Like, oh, that was awesome. But, but that to me is also a, a setup of the future relationship that they would have. So it was like, she's yeah. going to be tough and aggressive. And he was like, well, I don't play that shit. <laughs> and I was like, you can do that with anybody else, but me, I'm not the guy who's kind of plays that. Yeah, I, I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> well, <laughs> you notice what he did was he didn't take offense. He didn't take right. it personally, yeah. but he also let her know, but I am the boss and I'm not going to. I will be fall. taking this office. You're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we can be friends. <laughs> We're not. But I would like to say hello first. <laughs> Before I kick you out of my office. <laughs> and then she storms out and he has this little, hmm, there's a little look on every face as she walks past him. And he's like, and in my head, I took it. I think he goes, I like her. I'm, yeah. I got a good first so officer. Yeah. yeah. I want that. I need a firecracker like that. Yeah. Yeah. So and, I thought, yeah. Yeah. That was great. It's a great intro. But you know, the other thing I wanted to bring up was uh, the thing that they did in Discovery with Arium's character where they started to give us backstory and they started and we started to like her, but then they killed her off. And they basically did, it all, they did it all in one episode. And, and one of Aaron, your complaints was, I wish they gave us more of that right. earlier 
so that I could be attached to her and I can have sympathy for her character and I can understand where she's coming from better. And I felt like that little Arium way that they opened a window into her reason of why, because it comes down to, to a lot of the times, why? We know what, where, when, and who, but the why of why people are there, what's, what, what, why are the Bajorans there? Why are the Cardassians here? Why is Cisco there? Why, you know, why are all these things happening? And then as you become familiar with the characters and their reasons, their why, each one of them, and how they blend in together, that I think is what Deep Space Nine did so well right away off the bat. Whereas like one of my complaints and yours too was they give us very small glimpses of that on Discovery, but don't really give us a large meaning of why, except for the case of Michael Burnham and Spock. But mostly the other characters, you don't really have uh, a real development of who they are and why they, how they ended up there, why they're there. And I felt like our show, you know, really gave everybody a reason why they were there. Even but Bashir. Even Bashir, as, as innocent and, and somewhat ignorant as it was, as Kira put him in his place, you know, like, well, these frontier folk that you're out here to, oh boy, I get to work yeah, with these people. I was just like, are my friends, are my family, are my people, and they're yeah. hurting and they're dying. So why don't you go save them? Thank you. You know, she <laughs> was like, and he's like, ooh. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so, but, yeah. but he's wide eyed and bushy tailed, you know, and, hitting on Dax in front of the commander, which was a little, you know, pushing the boundary. Which actually reminds me a little bit of Tilly, the way he started yeah. off on us. Yeah. He yeah. kind of comes in a little, like, blundering. And, a little and green behind the ears. A little green looking, even though he's supposedly the most qualified doctor and he had a, cho choose, he had a choice of any place he could go yeah. and he chose to be a D.B. Stein. So they made him, like, this outstanding recruit but then he comes in and he's kind of like, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 should I put, do you want this here? Do you want me to put it here? <laughs> and I thought that was interesting. Uh, but I do think that uh, Nana has a strong female character. And if you want to say that yeah. one of the things that is groundbreaking about our show was, one, they, they chose a black man to be the captain. Mm -hmm. and hey, Nana but, and also with that, a strong desire for, for a strong family, you know, to be right. a, to be well, a, a, a right. centered around a black family, essentially. Yeah, but also with parenting number one on his list. Yeah. Right. That's very, very. So a black father. Yes. A single exactly. black father, yes. which, is, which is even the rarest of rare. Right. Especially <laughs> the time, right? That totally is, though. Yeah. In the this world. Right so, out of the 80s yeah. and the 90s. So they took, and, they took a risk on, on saying, we're going to yeah. center a show around a single black father. That's number one. Yeah. The second thing that I think they did a really good job on our show is, strong, is showing strong female characters. Mm -hmm. and, and that is specifically the Na Visitor's character. And she did being just, a, just assertive, take no shit from anybody, and really just, uh, you know, owned, owned the role of being, you know, a leader. And I thought that that, in, for a lot of girls out there who, who, who want to see themselves portrayed in a way in which that they are powerful, strong, independent, courageous women, that, that she is a good role model for that. And, uh, yeah. You know, adding on been. to that, and has been, yeah. Adding on to that was that's also how I felt about Jadzia Dax's character. Was I, you know, no offense to Star Trek, but the first couple series of Star Trek, I feel like they struggled a little bit in writing for women. Mm. Um, but I felt like Jadzia Dax was the first time where they had like this multi layered character where they weren't like, She's either a badass or she's submissive. Mm. You know, she was like, she was a badass, but not out of aggressiveness. She just was because she didn't care. She was like, hey, I'm fine. I'm tough. I can beat up Klingons or I can hump Klingons or I can, you know. Dance with Ferengi. Yeah, dance Ferengi or, or date a guy that has a, a transparent cranium or whatever like that. And she was also one of the girls, you know, she wasn't like sacrificing one part, you know, she wasn't sacrificing 
you know, femininity for toughness or toughness for femininity or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I thought they did a really good job. I think she nailed it as an actress too. And then on the other hand, you also had Kira who was like fully on, on the tough side of the spectrum. So I thought Deep Space Nine was, was really Star Trek getting their sea legs in writing for women personally. Mm. I think, I think they did a very good job as, uh, for, for, for the portrayal of women in, 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 on screen. They, they added to whatever's been existing at the time. But they also did a great, tremendous job of taking the risk of uh, going with Avery as the captain, who I thought you know, showed a lot of uh, range in his performance. Yeah. Because um, he goes from so stern and take, you know, just, just take charge and aggressive and, and, and really sometimes even cold when he has to deliver it, his, his, mm -hmm. you know, his seriousness. But then he also goes to playful and light. And dancing on the sand. Yeah, and, he, and, 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 and flirting, with, <laughs> Je and, and flirting with Jennifer on the beach, you know. Yeah. Well, you know and and he, you see the dynamic of him, you know, in his, in his regular clothes, civilian clothes, walking on the beach trying to flirt with this girl and he's 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 vulnerable he's soft he's playful but then he also goes to this like you know i'm i'm i don't i'm disobeying or you know <laughs> and then he goes into this other which is like this intellectual version of him which is you know questioning the you know the prophets and saying well why do you think this way and let me explain to you my thought process and so he then he he kind of delves into another side of him, which is this intellect, this, this. Program. Well, what's important is they didn't, did not make him one dimensional. That's oh, no. what they did so well. Sure. Yeah. You know, they wrote it that he was not one dimensional. Or he didn't play it one dimensional either. Correct. He could have played it straight across the board himself. Right. That's true. As an actor. He chose to be light when it was there. He chose to put smiles and, you know, actually, I don't know if you ever, if you guys ever had a chance to watch uh, a man called Hawk or Spencer. No, Hawk, but that, Spencer but Hawk. that was the character that he eventually became a few seasons later. You know, well, to some degree, because even in, and as I rewatched DS Nine, he's a lot softer, and he softened his his character up for Deep Deep Space Nine for Star Trek, so that he could play that role. Because when you see him on Hawk. Or Spencer for hire, uh, he's completely street and stone cold, and there is no middle ground. There, there's no laughing. There's no. There's no family. Mm. The loner. That's what softens him. And he has mm. no no wife, no woman, no family. So he's a literally like you know this mythical mythological character that roams through the night and solves mysteries and problems for the inner city uh, neighborhoods. So I think that in the Hawk character, he's so stern, so street, so tough. And then you see him on Captain Sisko and he becomes, he's, he's much more layered and intelligent and articulate in different ways than he is in Hawk. Hawk is more the street version. And here I see him in this more, uh, you know, let's say corporate, the corporate, version being in, in the corporate world and being able to function mm. with that same type of toughness that he brings and bringing strategic you know by saying you know we need a community leader and that's going to be you quark or gosh like, that's my favorite or how oh, he's, funny line he's yes. figuring out how to play each other each character against themselves and how like he's going to put you know he's not, finding out what he's dealing with like, who, who are like. these people i'm around who's who how do they function and he doesn't challenged him he's observing at least in this first episode he's observing kira he's observing quark he's seeing you know how they are as what their intrinsic characteristics are and how they function so I and, he, and he put a kid in a maximum security prison yeah. i mean that takes a lot of guts to put which, a little uh, <laughs> which brings me to my uh, final question because we only have a couple minutes left but aaron uh we didn't really touch too much on when you first came on you know, did they give you any kind of idea as to how many times you'd be brought back or did you think it was kind of a one-off and, and how was that, that, that experience of shooting those first couple scenes? Uh, so yeah, no, I had no idea. I had no idea 
I was, I was brought on as, as a guest star on the episode. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know if they even said it was recurring. Um, they might have, but I, I, in, basically I had a contract for one episode. So the scene I did that I met Jake was actually part of the pilot, but they moved it to a man alone. Um, and so when I did the pilot, all I did, I don't know if we did both scenes at that time and then they, I think I did and they moved it to man alone. I'm not sure. But the first <laughs> scene I did, I'm pretty sure was me stealing the stuff, the ore with, with um, uh, the guy. I actually, I had another scene where I sewed his lips together. So, so I, I knew we could get away with it because he talks a lot. So I, but they cut that with, for time. So uh, coming out and not really knowing what a Ferengi is and only learning from the last outpost, because that's how I kind of learned what to do in the audition. Sure. So when I come out and I'm kind of busted and I'm looking at everybody and, and Quark comes out, Armin Shimmerman, and he goes, <laughs> I just go <laughs> right back at him. <laughs> and I realized, oh, I guess we hiss at each other. <laughs> guess, you know, sometimes you go, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, and then I had this hunch look, so I'm like, oh, okay, I guess this kind of works. But that's because that's what they did in the last outpost. They had this kind of hunch, and I go, oh, all right. So really learning, learning on the job. I, there was no manual, you know. And as we go through the series and get to some of those episodes later, uh, you know, I can tell you how that came about. And 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 then you know, the first day working with Sirach, although I don't remember the first day, but I remember, I do remember always, as the years went on, asking him, is this, does my voice sound right? Is this about right? <laughs> and, then, and, then well, he would, and he would ask me as if I have my, my PhD in Ferengi uh, <laughs> analysis. Uh, does that sound right? I'm like, I don't know what the Ferengi sounds like. But yeah, I it asked sounds you. Good. I asked you because I worked with you more than anybody. So you heard me. So I, I, I thought to myself, so I would only compare you to yourself. So yeah. I would <laughs> like how you did it yesterday. So all these years, you know, I'm thinking, good. Srock said good. So I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, whatever, man. Sounds good. <laughs> you know, um, whatever gave you the confidence, buddy. We only have a few kid, my friend. Left. But he still does that. When we worked on Renegades together and he was trying on, we were putting all this makeup on him and he was becoming a, a brand new alien and was getting to create his own thing. He yeah. was even asking me, he's like, what do you think of this voice? What do you think? Because he was, he had to create an alien on the fly. So he was just like, he's like, maybe if I tilt my head and, do, and it worked out beautifully. So whatever you did, Ciroc, yeah, worked out beautifully too. So good job coaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no. Whatever I can do I basically, for you, I basically needed a 13, 14 year old, 15 year old to coach me to make sure I had my voice spot on. It was cuddling. It was a lot of cuddling, guys. Uh, you know, when you deal with young kids, you gotta. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> but I didn't know if I would be back. And so all I would think about is do the best I can, do the best job I can, you know, and work hard, be on time and. That's all I ever did episode after episode that they gave me and they just kept writing for me. So you were awesome. And I think we, the level of professionals that we had around us was just, I mean, there's countless, everybody really brought a level of professionalism yeah. and, and expertise to the table. And, and, and the one thing that popped up to me on the emissary was you could see the theatrical experience of a lot of the actors because it, it just felt so rich with the, with the language and, you know, it felt theatrical, that's all. Yeah. We're going to talk a lot more about that next week. Uh, please join us again when we do the second episode of Deep Space Nine. Always remember the seventh rule.